This is the story of a man who held his own against the allied shinobi forces, started fourth great ninja war and became the strongest shinobi alive until Madara consumed the divine god tree. So let's begin. The first lesson Team 7 had to learn as shinobi was teamwork. They initially all fought for their own self-interests, which prompted Kakashi to tell them about the memorial stone. Later, once Sasuke and Sakura sacrifice their food for Naruto, Kakashi unexpectedly passes them and reveals to them his philosophy in life. His mystery is further compounded with the reveal of his Sharingan as well. Kakashi is built up as a man of mystery throughout part one, and after the third Hokage's death, he is shown mourning at the grave of someone called Obito in a very somber scene. Note that the chapter in which Obito's name is first mentioned is the chapter in which Akatsuki first shows up. Likely coincidence, but interesting nonetheless. So tons of shit happens and the darkness in Sasuke grows. He eventually abandons Konoha to join Orochimaru. The cast is left crestfallen after his betrayal, with Naruto promising to bring him back no matter what. The chapter in which this resolution occurs, releasing shortly before Kakashi Gaiden, starts off with this. The remaining pages revolve around Naruto's conviction to keep his promise to Sakura, and about comrades who have fallen into darkness. By hindsight, this was effective and subtle foreshadowing for Obito's role to come. Next, immediately sandwiched between parts one and two, we have the Kakashi Gaiden revealing the character of Obito for the first time and showing his role in shaping Kakashi's life. Obito's character from beginning to end centered around the themes of injustice and cherishing one's comrades. He not only vowed to crush the shinobi that diverged from his dogma, but he was able to gather the resolve to kill someone in order to protect Kakashi. This was likely his first kill. At this point, it is of course important to touch on Obito's love for Rin Nohara. Obito was a kind-hearted Uchiha with big ambitions to be Hokage and end the war. But among the prestigious Uchiha clan, he was a washout, a disappointment. For a long time, his only real support was Rin, and so he became attached to her. Obito's insistence on rescuing Rin in the Gaiden was not, however, just because of his feelings for her. They played a role, but she was also a comrade of his, much like Kakashi. They did, however, play a larger role in his request to Kakashi. Obito ended up being smashed by boulders in the process of saving Kakashi. The two had formed a bond by then, so he entrusted his eye to Kakashi, telling him they would see the future together. Even though he had been very mature throughout this experience, however, Obito was still a child at heart and told Kakashi to protect Rin at any cost. Now it's very important to note Obito's last thoughts before being supposedly killed. His most desperate wish is to survive so he can spend more times with the people he cherishes, which will become his main drive when rehabilitating in Madara's cave. Afterwards, a battle ensues and Kakashi moves to protect Rin. He later wakes up with Minato sitting beside him and wonders if he survived. However, he was not the only one to survive. Obito found himself in a very similar but less fortunate situation. He awakes in an underground cave with Madara Uchiha. He is relieved to be alive, but is constantly driven by the desire to return to his comrades and protect them with his newfound power. Madara reacts to this by telling him his hopes are futile and reality is cruel. But Obito, of course, would not pay heed to this until much later. The only thing giving Obito hope and strength during this drawn-on underground recovery, with half a body and surrounded by strangers and pessimism, is the thought of returning to his comrades. That thought is what keeps him going, during his time spent down under. Obito's most prominent trait for a while now has been hope. He's put all his being into reuniting with his comrades and escaping from this creepy geezer. But the reality ended up being far harsher. Obito's entire world was shattered in this instant. The power he had entrusted to his newfound friend Kakashi to protect Rin was robbing her of her life. Obito's Sharingan perfected Kakashi's Chidori. Not only did Obito lose the one he loved, but his view of the world was shattered. All his hopes were crushed in that instant. But what happens here is one of the key differences between Obito and Madara. Obito does not lose hope in the world. He denies that he has it. He refuses to accept the reality before him. For Obito was in an unfamiliar place, in unfamiliar circumstances, and his life just fell apart before his eyes. 
His immediate response is to reject what he sees. In contrast, Madara slowly but surely lost hope in the world over time. He accepted what the world was, or rather his perception of it. Obito couldn't. He never developed, or had time to develop the mental state for it. The person he loved most was killed by his best friend and all his efforts had proven useless. Unlike Naruto, Obito was alone and the people he did have, well, it's self-explanatory what happened there. Obito from this point on started operating in the shadows towards the completion of Madara's plan. Obito's general persona from this point on slowly becomes more detached and warped. He gains a sadistic bend to his personality and becomes increasingly divorced from reality as he has abandoned or rather suppressed his hope for the world. He still is fixated on and values camaraderie, but it's not in the same way he did before. It's more self-serving now. He values loyalty so long as it's loyalty to him. However, when double-crossed, he will be merciless. The seeds for this were planted earlier though, albeit in a more innocent form. This is an important divergence from Madara, who didn't really care about the loyalty of his comrades so much as their usefulness to him. As seen by him giving no shits when learning of Nagato's betrayal, and not caring about Obito having his own plans either, Obito's also become quite deluded by this point, choosing to consider the real world and its inhabitants fakes, and the Mugen Tsukuyomi world to be truth. Basically, he considers bonds and interpersonal relationships to be a farce because he believes the world will sever those ties without fail and cause people to sink into despair. Thus, uniting together would eliminate that and create harmony. The way Obito sees it, this shinobi world that doesn't align with how he thinks things should be is false. And the moon's eye plan, Tsuki no Mekekaku, is the remedy. The thing is, while Obito did initially defect, due to the shock, trauma, and despair induced by everything to do with Rin's death. He still did not have the hardened outlook on the world he would display in his adult years. As he made moves towards the completion of his plan, Obito observed the shinobi world's workings, and it only served to deepen his conviction. Obito, though not as far gone as Madara, steeped himself in the darkest areas of the shinobi world. What he saw just reinforced his belief, or rather he made it so. He surrounded himself with fallacy, his identities of Madara and Tobi, and negativity. Even when seeing the brighter aspects of the world, Obito would brush it off. This shared outlook on the world may be why Obito considered Kisame the person closest to him. So we've established what Obito is like by the time the main story unfolds. However, something starts to happen in Obito after Nagato's betrayal at the end of the Pain Invasion arc. Obito is bothered that Nagato, who was quite similar to him, was convinced to switch sides. This sort of reignites the doubt in Obito's heart, and so he goes to ask Naruto about it. Naruto, the boy who was so much like Obito and inherited the younger Obito's ideals by way of Kakashi. Of course, Naruto cuts him off, and so Obito gets no immediate answer. His anxiety and anger towards Nagato and fixation on Naruto escalates when he fights Conan. This, of course, would come to a head in the Fourth Shinobi World War, where the two shinobi finally clashed head-on and pit their ideologies against each other. Can put my script. Interestingly, Obito also sees himself in Sasuke. Both were motivated by the death of someone they cared about, but chose to nullify their sacrifice for the sake of their personal ideals. Obito was asking Sasuke if he had the resolve to shit on the sacrifice of someone he loved for the sake of his own motives. Basically asking if he was like him. And well, Obito's corruption of Sasuke is even a direct mirror of when Obito awoke in a cave with Madara, who had sinister plans of his own for Obito. So yes, early as the summit arc, the conflict in Obito was making itself apparent. The fight Obito attempted to orchestrate between Naruto and Sasuke was a microcosm for Obito's own inner conflict that would come to a head in the war arc. Specifically when Kakashi and Gai arrived on the battlefield to help Naruto. He struggles harder than he'd anticipated in his battle with Naruto, who begins to gain traction in their clash and amasses chakra from almost all the other biju as well as finally sinking with Kurama. These past few panels are from chapter 573, which contains Naruto's comrades running to his aid and ends with this panel. You'll see later why this and a later panel perfectly bookend the meat of Obito's journey to find himself again. Now, Obito still manages to somewhat retain his composure in this chapter. But by the time the story next cuts to the battle, his detachment has lessened. 
His lunatic rantings increase in intensity, and he becomes more invested in Naruto and Kakashi. He was probably having those Rin flashbacks people love to criticize too, but they couldn't be shown then for obvious reasons. Once his mask is finally broken, Obito can no longer really run from his insecurities and grief. After all, now that he's unmasked, he won't be able to escape more personal questions from Kakashi. He has to address things in more detail than he'd like to, at least to some extent. Although he initially maintains some remnants of the detachment he'd held till then. However, he soon fights Kakashi one on one and his rage boils to the surface. Now, I only posted enough of this to get the point across. But this man really beat the living shit out of Kakashi. He's angry, despite his prior claims to have cut himself off from personal ties. At any rate, towards the conclusion of their scuffle, Naruto joins in and starts touting his resolve to protect his comrades and defeat Obito and Madara. Now, it's around this point that Obito really attempts to crush Naruto's ideology, as it's basically his own, formally, of course. But Obito, desiring to twist Naruto and in turn solidify his own conviction, was first hinted during his fight with Conan, where he swore to fade him into darkness. He believes Naruto and basically every shinobi is destined to turn out like him. Scum, basically. At least I doubt he meant everyone would become a psychotic masked murderer. Obito recognizes that Naruto's ideology was basically the mirror image of his own, among their other similarities. By this point, his resolve has wavered a good deal, so he resorts to trying to break Naruto's spirit in order to convince himself his path isn't mistaken. This is a good time to bring up something I don't think I can fit anywhere else. While trying to convince Naruto to abandon reality, Obito brings up the deaths of Minato, Kushina, Jiraiya, and of course Neji. All things caused directly or indirectly by Obito himself. This is why the act that Madara orchestrated Rin's death is irrelevant. It's beside the point of Obito's despair, and I dare say if he learned of this while still evil, he wouldn't have changed. He didn't even like or trust Madara to begin with. It was the fact that such things occurred at all that raked at Obito's mind. After all, it's not like Obito has never manipulated people for his own ends. So this moment is more meant for Madara's development because it demonstrates his extreme arrogance which is shattered when he is betrayed by Black Zetsu and learns he was the biggest pawn of all. Anyway, soon enough the Ten Tails starts to go out of control. This prompts Obito to commence with his plan of making Kakashi stab through Madara's puppet seal, which would enable him to become the Jinchuriki. I'm pretty sure I've covered all the relevant characterization focused on in his battle with Kakashi in previous parts of this, so I'll just speed ahead to after that. Obito comes out of the Kamui dimension and is immediately assaulted by Madara, who wants Obito to Rina Tensei him. This point marks an interesting shift in the way Obito is portrayed, he is seen struggling against Madara's rods and relying on the memories and thoughts of his former comrades to propel him forward and resist the takeover. It's moments like this that almost makes him feel like the protagonist. But even with that, Obito still retains a villainous aura, as seen when he confidently declares that the war hasn't reached its end. Yet even after succeeding in becoming the Jinchuriki, his ego was still under siege by the Ten Tails. And once more he draws on his memories of his comrades to resist and regain control. This frequent blending of heroic and villainous portrayals makes his eventual change feel even more organic in my opinion. Obito's newly acquired power makes him the focus of the war, although Naruto, Sasuke and others start to gain on him, and even the playing field. Obito becomes more agitated at Naruto and is constant interfering with his aims. His frustration and fixation with Naruto has grown to an insane point. And it started with something so small and seemingly trivial. So anyway, Obito continues to question and nudge Naruto in order to reach a conclusion about his own choices. Now the my ninja way thing may come off as bullshit and might not seem like a good answer. But the thing is, Obito isn't asking Naruto how to fix the shinobi world's problems. He's simply trying to see if he has the will to persevere, no matter what the world throws at him. And by this point, Obito is almost convinced. Obito was never about grand visions concerning villages and government. That was Madara. Obito was always more intertwined with the personal aspect of suffering, which is why Naruto's refusal to break infuriates him. By this point, Obito's resolve has wavered considerable, resulting in his defeat. 
So this is the part where the main talk no jutsu stuff comes in. Through the contact between the chakra, Naruto and Obito enter a sort of shared mental space. There, having connected to his memories, Naruto confronts Obito, frustrated that someone so like him turned out how he did. A lot of the shit discussed has already been covered though, so this will be brief. I'll just post some interesting tidbits I may not have covered well enough earlier. First is this. Obito viewed himself as the second coming of the sage. Looking solely at the first image, you might think he was referring to Madara, but as shown in the second from his talk with Naruto, he really was referring to himself. He also refers to Nagato as the third sage of the six paths after his fight with Conan, presumably as someone who also carried his will. Why did he not include Madara as a sage? Well, for whatever reason, Obito never seemed to trust Madara. He never wanted him revived, and as stated, he never saw him as an ally. Might have something to do with that puppet seal Madara planted in him to prevent him from becoming the Jinchuriki himself. Another interesting point in Obito's talk with Naruto is this parallel with the Kakashi Gaiden. Chapter 241, Chapter 653. So at the end of this talk, Obito is more conflicted than ever and with the combined power of both Kurama and the allied forces, the Biju are released from Obito. It works well thematically as an end to Obito's threat because Naruto both utilized the power of all his comrades on the battlefield in the ultimate triumph of Obito's original philosophy over his new one, and Kurama's power, which was originally placed in Naruto for the purpose of defeating Obito in the first place. Having been definitively beaten, Kakashi has a final talk with Obito about the path he chose. And guess what the chapter ends on? Our friend, the panel from chapter 573. At this point, Obito finally accepts that his path was wrong, and the whole Nagato thing that jump-started his indecision is given a conclusion as well. He resolves to give his life to Rinatense, his victims in the war, but Black Zetsu intervenes and forces Madara's resurrection. Obito is put out of commission for a while, but eventually regains his senses and uses Madara as a means to steal his resolve. Sure, he had switched sides, but he was mellow, depressed, and wrought with guilt. He didn't even believe himself worthy of redemption. But by talking with Madara, Obito contrasts Madara's ideals with that of Naruto and also his own original ideals, and finally reclaims his identity as Obito Uchiha, resolving to do his best and end the war. This layout with Obito caught between Naruto's, in actuality his own, and Madara's ideologies is a small-scale representation of a major theme of his character. Same with his fascination with Naruto and Sasuke, seeing a part of himself in both of them. Obito is the man on which the core of the Naruto series hinges. Even how his literal physical body was half Uchiha and half Senju DNA. He has always been a man of duality, represented by his association with the concept of yin and yang, yin and yang, or as Obito himself is fond of saying, oil and water. Obito proved to be an extremely valuable ally in the fight against both Madara and Kaguya, and gave his life one more time to protect Kakashi, Naruto, and Sasuke. He fought on with everything he had to redeem himself for even a fraction of the damage he'd done. He died not as the masked man or the harbinger of calamity, but as Obito Uchiha. Obito, in my opinion, is the best written character in Naruto. There's way too much unjustified hate and too many misconceptions about the character. This analysis was done by Ailmao. We, Verse Tube, just represented it in a way such that his words could reach out to all the Naruto fans who wish to know in depth about Obito. Thanks for watching!